Let's see. We should be going live in a minute. All right. Setting up. <clears throat> All right. I've got my tea because uh, my son keeps me up at night. There you go. <laughs> and do it. All yep. right. I think we are live. All right. Welcome, coaches. I'm just making sure everything is set. The meeting is now streaming live on Facebook. Awesome. Trying to find, please bear with us. Oh, there it is. Okay. All right. Let's get that so I can see your questions. Uh, welcome coaches. Sorry. I know this is awful. This is not the great, the best way to do this, but I am live here with coach Dan Casey. Uh, first off, Coach Casey, thank you so much for joining us and 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 talking ball with us. Absolutely. I appreciate you having me on. This is awesome. All right. So while coaches are coming in, coaches, if you have any questions, if you haven't seen one of these before, I do them on YouTube. I'm doing them on Facebook. Any questions, put them in the comment. This is kind of like a rolling interview where I ask Coach uh, Casey some questions and then I see what y'all have. I ask him y'all's questions and we're just spitting ball. Um, the reason why, and I, we were talking about this earlier, I reached out is because a lot of y'all are going to eight and nine man football and you ask me things and I'm going to be completely honest. I have no idea about eight and nine man football, but my man coach right here, he does head coach of an eight man football, right? Or nine man, sure. eight man, mm -hmm. eight man football. And I, I gotta be honest, man, when I knew this was coming, I was creeping on y'all's, uh, max preps page. Okay, y'all do some cool things, man. We tried to. We tried. It is, I'm like, oh, dang, y'all are airing it out, running, doing yeah. some RPOs. I'm like, I love that. And we're yeah. going to get into that. So if y'all have any questions, please put them in the comments. If this sounds okay, give it a thumbs up. And if you want to get some other coaches in, share it. And uh, coach, while the coaches are coming in and everything like that, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, my name's Dan Casey. I'm a high school coach in Raleigh, North Carolina. Played a college ball at Davidson College, just north of Charlotte, North Carolina. Our claim to fame was uh, Steph Curry and the basketball team for sure. But we, believe it or not, have a football program that's doing pretty well now. But when I was there, uh, we weren't, we didn't do too hot. But I get to, got to learn a lot for sure. Um, and then after my playing career, uh, I kind of thought I would, I would be uh, getting into full time ministry actually. So I went to seminary okay. at Duke University. I uh, had a great time there and about halfway through realized I really wanted to coach football. So got in touch with a, a local high school and, and got set up there and got a head coaching job when I was 24 years old and uh, I've had to figure a lot out since then. And so, uh, you know, I always tell people like the whole reason I got on social media was just to be able to talk to coaches about football and learn about the game and get and figure things out. And I've been really appreciative of how generous coaches have been sharing stuff and talking with me. So every chance I get to, to, to give back and share with others, I, I try to take that, take that opportunity for sure. All right. And I'm glad you talked about your social media because it is amazing. And coaches, I'm going to drop his social media in the comments for you to follow because you've, now we're going to talk about that too, because you've thrown up some great clips and it, it is unbelievable, but I didn't know you wanted to go into, is it ministry? I, or yeah, yeah. I, I, I thought I was going to be, um, studied religion in undergrad um, and then went to seminary to study theology. And, um, you know, still still matters a lot to me. My faith is important to me, but I feel like the, the vehicle for um, helping people out was, was football for me. That just made the most sense. And um, yeah, it just, that's what, that's what got me out of bed every morning. So I figured that that was what I was going to stick with. That is awesome, man. I did not know that. So I, was it, did you graduate with it? I did, uh, yeah. I okay. Okay. And then I didn't, didn't end up getting ordained as a pastor. Um, but I definitely see kind of, um, the, the football field as, as my place to, to impact people's lives and, and give them, um, give them perspective on life. And, you know, one of the things that I've always talked about with my, my coaches and my, my players is that, um, football is this microcosm of life where you're going to get, uh, you're going to get kids at their most vulnerable state because they're exhausted mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, they're pouring everything out there on the field and you get an opportunity in those moments to really give life lessons to those, those young men. And so it, it's just, I've seen the most impact, the most impact in my life came from coaches. Um, and I just knew that that was something I wanted to do at some point. 
And it's awesome. So the football field is your church. That's yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, it, within reason, I'm not trying to push oh, it. Yeah. Yeah. I understand. I understand. I totally understand. I, I definitely feel strongly about those, those principles getting instilled in, in kids. And, and I just feel like, feel like there's no better Avenue than, than through coaching. I completely agree, man. And I wasn't trying to start stir anything up when I good, was man. saying that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm fortunate. I, I do work at a private school, so I'm I'm able to be pretty open and about my faith journey with my my athletes and my coaches. But you know, I realize everybody's in a different spot with with all that stuff. But I just feel like uh, the biggest thing is just making a positive impact. And and you know, if coaches, I've seen coaches make the most impact either for the positive or the negative. And so, whichever way you decide to take it it's going to, it's going to really hit people hard. So the better you okay. can be, the, the better those guys experiences. I like it. All right. So coaches that are coming in, first off, thank you for uh, joining us. I'm here with coach Dan Casey. I have put his Twitter and his Instagram in the comments. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. So the first one I kind of want to know is, have you always been eight man? Like, is that, the whole time or have you were you at an 11 man and then went to eight man because eight man yeah. fascinates me yeah it's 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 wild man uh i only ever played 11 man obviously i didn't even know eight man existed to be honest um <laughs> so when I, I i was reaching out to some schools when i was in seminary about you know hey i want to coach and you know i think a lot of coaches probably get this like when you're trying to break in like you, you don't get email, your emails responded to, you don't get calls yeah. back, like, you know, unless you have experience. And so finally, um, I had a, a school reach out to me and they were looking for someone to be involved in the school on the kind of, so I'm actually the school chaplain as well, which is another cool part of things. Okay. Um, but then they also needed uh, somebody to help out with the football program. And that just sounded awesome to me. So yeah, I, I signed up and, and then they were like, oh, by the way, we play eight man football. Uh, so I started Googling what is eight man football? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> believe it or not, there's no resource, like there's no resources online about eight man football. Uh, there probably is more now, but when I was, you know, when I was starting out four years ago, nothing. Um, and so what I, what I think personally, the kind of the way I've seen it is the cool part about eight man football is I can't plug and play Nick Saban's quarters coverages. Yeah. Like, because I, I don't have 11 players in the field. So I can't take, I can't steal someone's playbook and, and just implement it with my guys. And so what I really had to do is I had to learn through trial and error, which I think made mm -hmm. me a better coach because there were certain things where I was just like, well, of course we're going to run zone read, right? Like we're going to read the end. And then my first year there, we tried to run zone read with three offensive linemen and we couldn't, we, like we could never execute that play because the edge was too short to read. And so you know, we found out pretty quickly that we were going to have to do, do some things differently and we couldn't just plug and play 11 man concepts immediately. We had to find ways to adapt them to the eight man game. Um, and so I think a lot of people ask me like, okay, explain eight man to me. And the, the best way I can describe it is you're down two offensive tackles. So you're down both tackles and then you're down a skill position guy. Um, and then on defense, the way I describe it to people is the philosophically, the equivalent of an even front is the equivalent of an odd front in eight man football. So like if I were playing, if I were in 11 man playing a three down front in eight man, I'd play a two down front. And if I was playing an even front, I would be playing a three down front in eight man. So it gets kind of complicated, but you just have to see the game a little bit differently. Um, it definitely hones you in on, on the uh, fundamentals of the game, because the reality is if somebody misses a tackle, it's touchdown. I mean, there's no room for error. Um, and so it, the games are high scoring, tons of energy, tons of uh, tons of excitement, uh, but it really forces you to hone in on the fundamentals of blocking and tackling. And if you're not willing to do that, there's no amount of scheming that are that are going to get you around um, because because you're, you're limited numbers. So you really have to focus on on those fundamentals for sure. OK, so in your opinion, since you are a high, uh, the head coach, is it? more difficult offensively schematic wise or defensively schematic wise in eight man? That's a good question. I think, uh, I think you can do a little bit less defensively um, just because if you're going to play zone coverage, which teams do, mm -hmm. um, those are huge zones to cover. Um, and so <laughs> <I bet. laughs> the, it's, just, it's just really tough for kids to handle that. And for me as an offensive coach, I, I do more on the offensive side of the ball. It's really easy for me to flood flood zones pretty 
pretty quickly. Um, so it really narrows down. You see a lot more man coverage. You see a lot, a lot of blitzing, a lot of overloaded stuff. I'd say, um, you know, with eight man football, it, it just, it, it totally depends. I mean, I think there are some teams that will line it up double tight eye formation and pound the ball. And there are other teams that will line up quarterback and center. Everybody else is split out. Uh, kind of the old. And are pole. they eligible? Oh, that's a great, are, are yeah. the guards eligible as well? So if you go unbalanced, you can have an eligible guard, um, which is, it totally blows your mind as a coach. Um, Cause I remember the first time a guard caught a touchdown pass on us, like there's, there's no way that's legal, but everyone, you know, they run an unbalanced front. So that guard was perfectly eligible. Um, so I think the atten- the amount of attention that the athletes have to pay to, um, to what kind of formations they're getting. Cause you see stuff, you, you don't see it on Saturday. You don't see it on Sunday. And so you don't, you really have to, to be dialed in with eligibility, who's covered up, who's off the ball. There's a ton of communication that has to happen on defense, even though you can't do as much schematically, mm-hmm. you have to communicate even more because you have to know who's got what. Um, and, and the gaps can get complicated too with some of these unbalanced fronts that you see. And I would say the majority of the teams in our league run a lot of unbalanced stuff, a lot of formation into the boundary stuff. So it's just, you know, things that, that complicate the game um, you see a lot of. Um, but it's, you know, it's exciting. It's, it's something that you have it. I think for me, when I get to look at a, an 11 man game, I, I see so many possibilities that I, that I think as, a, as an eight man coach, I look at the 11 man game and I'm like, man, there's so many possibilities here that people could really take advantage of some things that no one's really taking advantage of right now. Okay. And I'm glad you brought up watching 11, man, because I want to bring that up with your social media and what you do. But coaches, again, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I'm Coach Ron Mackey. This is Coach Dan Casey. We're talking all things eight-man ball. Uh, We got a couple of coaches coming from us. Uh, Coach Dan is saying most definitely talking about helping men grow when we were talking about that earlier. Uh, Coach Mike is from Washington State. My man Todd Place is watching, so I welcome y'all. Uh, if you have any questions, put them in the uh, chat. I will ask Coach that. Now, you said watching 11, man, you have a lot of possibilities that are just going through your head, right? Yeah, for sure. What's something that you're just you, – you're watching the games and you're going, why aren't they doing this? Yeah. This is, this is something I've mentioned to a couple friends of mine that are defensive coaches, but – one of the things that I think is is way underutilized in the 11 man game is unbalanced formations. Now you see a lot of teams running unbalanced, but a lot of times, like for example, um, Texas or Houston or, or some of these schools that that run spread, when they go unbalanced, they'll step a receiver on the line and cover him up. And so they're unbalanced formationally, but um, that ineligible is a skill position player. And from my perspective. I would, I, w- I would never want a skill position player to be the ineligible. Um, so for me, I love to see some of the tackle over stuff. And, and I think you do see it with, you know, triple option teams are certainly yeah, doing it. Do. Um, yeah. I think people are really concerned about protection and keeping things balanced. Um, but even, even some of the things that we do, uh, we use some like run and shoot footwork with our quarterbacks. So even though we're unbalanced, we can just step over that front side guard and still have a clean sense. Um, so it's, you know, I think that there are ways that you can get away with it. I, I mean, for me, like one of the things that we do is we pretty much base out of um, an unbalanced formation with an H back kind of moving, moving back and forth with that in eight man the backside guard is eligible. But if I was coaching 11 man football with, you know, you could go trips to the field, tackle over with an upside tight end. And all of a sudden you have access to all your run game stuff. You can run wide zone to the field. You can run counter back to the boundary. You can run all sorts of play action, you know, pulling guards and, and still having an eligible essentially tackle because it's your tight end with the, the line over. And what you're, what you're forcing defenses to do in my opinion is they have to tell you a lot of what they're going to do when you're in unbalanced, mm-hmm. but they have to tell you, okay, are they going to bump their front and they're going to treat that front side guard like the center or are they going to hang a corner backside? Are they going to play corner over? Like they're telling you so many things that they have to do if you're in these unbalanced sets. Whereas if you're playing 
more balanced, you're giving the defense, the defensive coordinator has his full menu to choose from. Whereas, you know, we always talk about how can we limit his menu um, formationally with some of the things we do or with motions or with different things like that. And I know like there's hardly anything new under the sun um, in football. I mean, you, you watch it enough, you, you realize that the new stuff is really just coming back yeah. around. Um, so I, I'm not, I'm not trying to say that I think if I, you know, was coaching 11 man football, I'd be doing something no one's ever seen before. It would certainly be principles that um, other people have already used and are using, but I think it just makes you think about the game a little bit differently. It makes you think more philosophically, less about the particular plays. So like one of the, one of the things that we hammer home all the time is like in every play, I want to have an option to have be powerful into the boundary or use my speed to the field. So getting guys in space. Um, and I think if you just philosophically start to develop um, game plans around some of these principles, they, they really do translate to eight man, 11 man. Um, another thing I talk about a lot with, with my coaching staff and our guys is um, we talk a lot about whether or not we have the speed advantage every game. And I'm, I'm sure this is something people have heard me say before, but like my particular opinion on that is if you have the speed advantage um, from an offensive perspective, you want to be looking to get vertical in the pass game and horizontal in the run game. And so that's something we do in eight man football. That's something that I think holds true in 11 man football. But if you don't have the speed advantage, you're looking to get vertical in the run game and maybe more horizontal in the pass game, allowing guys to create separation horizontally instead of vertically, because you don't have that top end speed to, to really threaten people deep. And so it's, I guess in some ways, it's not necessarily that eight man gives you plays for 11 man, but it does clarify the principles of the game. And I think it, it helps you philosophically realize that if you, if you choose to maintain simplicity, you can do that effectively, but you have to have a, a philosophy backing everything up, which I know you're, you know, you're, you're an air raid guy, so you get that completely. But, um, and I, I reference the air raid a lot. I reference the triple option a lot because to me, those two things are philosophically the same. I agree. Deciding to go all in, in one direction. I, so, I agree. So we, in eight man, we have the, the luxury of, you know, basically running, air raid and triple principles um, in the same offense because because of some of the sets that we that we run in and because we have a few less players it's it's a little easier and because the reality is I don't have five offensive linemen that can effectively run block or pass protect I'm really dealing with three two or three a year so I have a lot of skill position guys I'm sprinkling in there and so being able to run triple concepts with a little bit quicker offensive linemen or air raid stuff getting the ball out a little quicker benefits me just from a personnel perspective is that why because i have talked to a couple of amen coaches and the scores are just insane crazy like in the 50s 60s and 70s oh yeah oh yeah is that because you, there's a lot more creativity going on and because I, i'm looking at it from my point of view if i was put in your position yeah first off i would have no idea how to coach it <laughs> like no idea so i would be going from an 11 man perspective for sure yeah. And that has to be difficult to, I mean, like you, we were talking about, you played in college all throughout and it was all 11 man. Yeah. So you're kind of trained in the 11 man philosophy. Yeah. But then you have to go eight man. And I, I don't know, it just blows. I can't even form a sentence right now correctly because it's blowing <laughs> my mind. <laughs> I, know. I think the thing you have to, I think it's just like navigating scarcity. It's like you have so many options in 11 man. And with eight man, you just have to say like, these are the things we're going to hang our hat on. And you have to decide that like even more so with 11 man. And it has to come from like the best teams that I've played against in eight man are the ones that can run 15 different plays out of the exact same look. So you get the same action every play, but you're getting, so like we've played, we played teams that literally line up in, you know, again, eight, it's only eight players. So you got double tight. So five on the line and I formation. And you'll see those teams run basically like power O and then like run a Yankee concept with the tight ends off the of power O play action. And so those teams are just, they're so hard to defend because they're consistently line up, lining up in similar looks, but then they're giving you all kinds of different plays out of those looks. But then there's also those teams that will literally come out in a different formation every play. And so you're scrambling to ID formations and there's, a lot of teams that will put their best player at quarterback 
get everybody else out of their direct and snap the and, and it's a punt return. So <laughs> you've got some just every week you're dealing with things you've never seen before. Uh, okay, so then how do you how, how is your hair not like mine with all that yeah. possibility? I would be yanking my hair out going from one thing to another. It, I mean, you just have to you you have to realize that you're not going to be able to prepare for everything that you're going to mm-hmm. see because it's it's the wild west. So really <laughs> fundamentals and sticking to what you do is is the biggest thing. Um, so some of the traditional game planning you can get you can get done in eleven man football. It's not that you can't do that, not that we don't do that, but the reality is you have to say, we're going to get all these looks and we don't know when we're going to get them um, because teams come out in different things every week. Um, and, you know, based on their personnel, you know, if one kid goes down, all of a sudden they went from slinging it around oh, to I a bet. big wing team. You know, if that quarterback goes down, because most schools have a kid that can throw and that's about it. And so they will quickly shift from a air it out team to a single wing team. And you're, and sometimes they do that mid game. Um, so, oh God. so you're just, you know, it's, it's not like personnel matters so much. I mean, it obviously matters in 11 man as well, but you just can't get away from it in, in eight man. It's, it, it, it dictates everything you can do. Um, so if you got some, some really good players, you can do a lot of fun stuff. Um, if you're dealing with some more constraints, you, you really have to simplify. Uh, okay. Now I want I want to come back. You said something about philosophy of offense, yeah, and how you have to have one. I'm sure there's a philosophy of defense as well. Yeah. So what's your philosophy of defense then, in eight man? Yeah. Um, well, I think um, to the best of our ability, we try and we try and steal a gap up front somehow. Whether we two gap the the nose on the center, whether we um, sometimes on the backside, we can get away with playing like kind of a crash. It's the equivalent of a crash five in, in 11 man football where that D end is playing outside the tackle and then, you know, pressing him down and really playing into the B gap for us. It's a three technique playing the outside shoulder of the guard and then playing across into this, to the A gap. Um, so we try and steal a gap to have an extra player available at run pass, you know, uh, to help out a little bit. Um, in either the run game or the pass game. Uh, But, you know, I think more than anything, it's philosophically on defense, you just have to preach speed to the football um, and getting, getting all the guys pursuing to the football. Uh, Because even if you have, even if your gap sound, you know, you take away both the A gaps and, you know, whatever the B gap may look like um, you're just dealing with so much space on the field. Um, and so you have to be careful about who you're, even if you are gap sound, who, who's in those gaps um, on a wide zone player, are they going to be able to, to carry that gap all the way to the sideline or are you going to have to overlap, um, do some different things like that. And so, you know, one of the things that we do is we try and, um, you know, and, and this is maybe even bigger picture stuff. We, we play a lot of press man coverage. Um, okay. And, part of the big picture for that for me is um, and this comes from some of my friends at USA football, who we talk a lot about tackling and a lot about player safety and all these different things. Um, but they did, they've done a study with some high school programs where playing press man coverage drastically reduces the, the overall amount of tackles that take place during a single game. And so because teams are realizing, you know, press man, I'm going to take a shot here, or mm-hmm. you have more numbers in the box, so it's less advantageous. And so you do see some bigger plays, but you also see more incompletions. Okay. okay. Um, and so from, from the big picture perspective, you know, I'm also thinking about sustainability in the long term for, for my program. How do I make sure, and with guys playing both ways, um, how do I reduce or limit the number of collisions and tackles that are happening during the game? One of the ways is to play cover one, some cover zero, um, basically telling them to telling them where they can, they can put the ball. Um, so I realize, like within each individual game that may change based on who they've got and how confident we feel with our guys out there on the edge. But from a philosophical perspective, like I always want us to be able to come back to cover one or come back to cover zero and say in a pinch, like this is something that, that, that is an identity marker for us. And, you know, I think, you know, some of the, the best, the better defensive coordinators, obviously they have good players so they can do this, but when push comes to shove, you know, as far as from what I've seen, like 
if things are going bad, Saban's going to go cover one or cover zero. <laughs> and, and just because you eventually you have to put your foot down and say, and all, of this, all of this match coverage is good. All this quarter stuff is good, but eventually if the chips are down, what are we doing? We're, we're yeah. pressing and we're playing ball. So, you know, again, I focus more on the offensive side of the ball. I more contribute some of the big picture ideas on the defensive okay. side of the ball, even though I, I played defense in college um, and have some opinions on it. Um, I, I definitely try to put the majority of my energy over on the offensive side of the ball. When okay. I, so that is awesome. Okay. We got, we've got some questions if you don't mind. Yeah, for sure. Um, so we have, and again, coaches, if you're just coming in, welcome. I am talking with coach Dan Casey. We're talking eight man. Uh, coach Randy is driving his truck on the road. Please be careful. You know, uh, don't, don't want you to get in a crash. Coach Jeff has been a part of nine man amateur football for eight years now. I use a lot of everyone's 11 man concepts and turn them into nine man. Yeah. Some of them don't always work because of the lineman factor. I'm sure you've, sure. you've run into that as well. Without a doubt. Yeah. Do you, do you, we're, we're all guilty of doing this, but I'm just curious if you're guilty as well, or do you have more discipline? We watch a game, we see a cool play. We go, you know what? That's going in next week. <laughs> but do you do that? Then when you come to the office or you start mapping it out, you're like, Oh, we don't have the players to do that. Yeah. I mean, if, if you follow me on Twitter, you probably would imagine that I see. Yes. Like notebooks on notebooks um, <laughs> on notebooks, man. <laughs> I have way, way too much stuff. One of my, one of my good coaching friends always says, you know, you have the coach's playbook and you have the player's playbook. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and one of the, I, I think kind of unique things we do, um, I, I'm, it's something I really like. Um, I, I don't know how sustainable it would be at a, you know, college program, certainly professionals, a, a totally different game. But um, one, one of the things that we do is, you know, we don't have spring ball. We, we don't get a ton of time okay. with my guys over the summer. We, um, we do the best we can. Uh, but the reality is a lot of times we get into training camp and we have two or three weeks before we play our first game. Um, and oh, wow. that's, it, it's, that's a lot to get in. And so in order to kind of account for that, one of the things that we started doing was um, setting up our install like a syllabus for a class. And so instead of dumping an entire offense on them in training camp, we basically mapped it out where we could, we could carry enough into week one, but we were going to evolve throughout the, the entire season. And so we, we talk about stacking concepts a lot. And so we, we put in our base concepts and kind of what our, what we think our identity is going to be that year. And then each week we have something new that goes in and that's pre-planned. That's not game plan. That's okay. something that we know, even if we decide not to use it that given week it's in. And so we're installing that on, you know, the Monday of that week and the kids have kind of picked up on the fact that so they're going to get something new and we may have some game plan stuff too. Um, but for the most part, like that syllabus is, is pretty consistent throughout the season. And so the hope is that we can, um, within the same kind of offensive identity throughout the season can grow and become more multiple as the season goes on. And it's not this daunting task of them trying to fit all these ideas into one, you know, training camp, um, cause okay. we just don't get the amount of time that, that I'd like to get with them. Um, and so, you know, I, I think I may, I may have gone a little far afield from your, your question, but um, I think for me, I, I certainly face the temptation of wanting to put stuff in. Um, and we kind of have, we have, um, we, we, instead of pre-practice, we have post-practice. So we don't do pre-practice, we hit the field and we practice. Okay. And then at the end, we always try and, you know, leave gas in the tank for the end of practice. We, we try to never send them home on empty. Um, that's kind of a philosophy we have, but at the end of practice, we do our post-practice and that's when I can experiment with a concept that I, that I've been looking at. That's when a kid can say, Hey coach, I can do this thing. And I'm like, show me, we, we call it our show me period. You know, a kid says, I've been working on this route with the quarterback and I want to show you. Um, and it just gives kids an opportunity to kind of express themselves a little that's bit. Awesome. And, and it gives us coaches a chance that um, to, to try something out, maybe correct something that happened earlier in the practice um, but ultimately like we, we schedule out our practices for whatever, the, whatever it is, 90 minutes. And then those couple periods at the end are those post-practice flex periods. So some, I mean, some days 
practice is brutal. We, we got to clean some things up. We'll use it for that. Some days we did really well and we can experiment on some things. Some days we feel really good about it. We send them home early, uh, but we never keep them late. Uh, that's something that I just feel like is really important as a coach. Um, if I tell you we're going to be done by this time, especially if your parents are coming to pick you up, um, I want to make sure I get you out on time. But the post-practice part for me is fun because that's where I can experiment with something. And I always give my players the leeway to say, I don't feel comfortable with this. And then we can shelve it or we can throw it out altogether. We, we always joke in, in the coach's office that um, we have a big trash can for a reason for all the ideas that we don't use. Um, and for everything you say no to, it's reaffirming you saying yes to something else, something that's more important. Um, and so we, we preach minimalism and essentialism a lot. Like those are things that I, I think are really- I love important. it, you're speaking my language. Yes, no, speaking my language, man. Uh, but at the same time, there's, with certain teams, like they need complexity and they need multiplicity and they need to be able to, to you need to be able to scheme up a four yard gain for some teams, whereas other teams, there's a kid that can get the four yard gain regardless of what you draw. Um, and so I think as coaches, we're always kind of dealing, like it's, it's a sliding scale. Like some, some years we're able to be super simple and, and roll with it and it works out. And some years we, we really have to get, slow it down and get more complex and be a little bit more creative. And I think you just have to, re like the thing I always challenge myself with is like, this isn't last year. Like this is a new year. Like it's going to have new challenges, new excitements. Um, we're going to be dealing with a whole different group of kids, even if we have, seven returning starters um it's a whole new team and and how are we going to treat that of course we have our principles we have our core values we have the things that we always do but uh two years ago we were a wide zone outside outside zone team we tore it up and this past year we had a little bit more trouble moving the football we had to get downhill a lot more power counter gap scheme stuff so that just kind of became our identity as the season wore on and um you know, I started us off thinking we were going to go right back to that wide zone outside zone stuff and we wouldn't have any problems and we had problems. So we had to figure that out. And uh, that, that changed our identity as a team, but um, we had the flexibility within the system to, to account for some of that stuff. Okay. So that happened as the season progressed or did you know day one, like, ah, we're not going to be able to do this. I knew pretty early on from a mobility standpoint up front, what we had and from, you know, we, we lost a pretty dynamic uh, running back mm. and we just had to do, we had to do some different things. Uh, we were a little thinner. Um, so we didn't have the depth that we had in years past. And so, you know, it, it's one of those things that um, I always, I always talk about like getting false positives. Like when we, when we do something really well, as I think as a coach, I start to feel like I've got something figured out. Um, and a lot of times that's, that's a false positive uh, and, and just being super <laughs> critical of even the good things we do. Like, is, is it because it was a good scheme or was it because we have good players um, and making sure we're always striving to put kids in the best position to make plays based on their skill sets. That's, that's kind of the challenge we always, I mean, every coach faces that, but I think I just try and uh, to the best of my ability, humble myself each season and say, eh, maybe I don't have it figured out. <laughs> just cause, that's smart. Know, you know, new the good ones do every year. All right. So now we have coach Mike. He wants to know what kind of defenses or coverages give your offense issues. Yeah. So uh, with eight man football, um, I would say um, we, we will face teams that will run. Um, I guess it's kind of like the equivalent of like heavy inside leverage cover two. Uh -huh. so what they'll do is they'll make their corner kind of a, he's a hard corner he's a run support player he's a you know he's a he's a force player and what they'll do is kind of cloud a cloud of safety over the top or, or roll a safety over the top of your your split receiver and and that's given us trouble because it's kind of um the the throw they're really giving you is like an out route to the field um which is a tough throw i think for for high school kids, I think some schools have, have yes, a kid to make that throw consistently, can throw that 12 yard out to the field, no problem. Um, and we, we had a kid that did it pretty well, but even from a consistency standpoint, uh, I think that was, that was tough for us um, because it, it prevented us from getting the edge on some stuff because they were really able to set a hard edge with that corner. And the, the thing about eight man is there's no, there's not necessarily clarity around body types like everybody is in a, a kind of a similar body type so you'll have a 
that's playing corner who's also playing guard on offense like he's oh wow he's a, you know he's a bigger kid but i mean he's not huge but he's maybe 180 190 pounds but he's not playing like deep corner he's like or, or playing man he's playing like force player on the edge so, you know i think coaches it's you know i, I think a couple of years ago a lot of 11 man coaches were talking about positionless defense of mm-hmm. you know, being really flexible and able to play all the way from safety to D line. Like that's, that's every kid in eight man. Like you're, you're going to see all different types of body types. Of course you, you occasionally will get kids that are pretty clearly um, offensive and defensive linemen, but I think that that's the stuff that's given us the most trouble. Um, there's a really good coach um, at Arndell Parrott um, out in Kinston, North Carolina, who's been there forever. Coach Beeman, he's, he's phenomenal. He gives us trouble every year. Um, and, and, and it's just, it's fun, man. I mean, there's, you think eight man football, um, you think a lot of coaches don't know what they're doing, but there's some guys that are really sharp and, and come up with some really creative things, really creative schemes and, um, you know, can, can definitely give you some trouble. And, and every coach has to decide, um, what we, what they value the most. Some coaches say, we're not going to give you the edge. So, you know, at all costs, our ends are going to play wide and not give you the edge or whatever some coaches are saying we're going to spill everything and try and run it down. And you, you see that similarly in 11 man football, but I think that um, the, the things that we've had the, the most trouble with probably have been that, that hard cover to um, okay. that force force corner, but he's really like a safety linebacker. It's crazy. Slash guard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good stuff. All right. Uh, Coach Brian wants to know what's the most common blitz combos you see two man game twisting or three man game. I would say, man, the most, the most you get is um, you get a lot of double a gap pressure. Um, you get a lot of oh, double edge pressure and the edge is so short in eight man football that, you know, the, the blitz is coming off the edge come really fast um, unless you, you know, even if you have a, a tight end or a tackle, even if you have a wing, like the edge is so short. So for quarterbacks, um, you know, quick game is the quickest game you can imagine. <laughs> I bet. I bet. <laughs> so it really quickly. And, you know, there's a lot of teams that will overload their front. So like if you got your three down, there will be teams that will go strong A, strong B, edge, and come on and it's just impossible to get your backside guard in on that action because it's there's just there's nowhere to go so unless your quarterback just decides he's going to bail and run though a lot of times with that overloading spot you see you see a little bit of everything um we have moved toward you know i used to get four out routes a lot um Mm -hmm. and i think i had to move away from that a little bit just because we struggled in protection um and so i've had to to keep keep guys in a little bit more, do some slide protection stuff, do some split zone play action stuff that just kind of balances up our formation, um, power play action that kind of just gives us, gives us better angles on the edge. Um, yeah. Cause it's, it, it can be tough for sure. I bet. All right. That's good stuff right there, man. I didn't even think about doing that. Um, let's see coach. Where was it? There we go. Coach Murphy or Murray. I'm sorry. Uh, how do you like to draw up run plays when you're trying to convert from 11 man? What fronts do you usually see? Because he is a third year coach coaching eight man as well. For sure. I would say that um, the only way to truly convert a concept to from 11 man to eight man is either you're going to go double tight and balance your front up or you go unbalanced. So unbalanced would be the eligible guard, backside, center, guard. We call it a stud tackle. Uh, Mm -hmm. Our stud tackle is ineligible, um, but you get the two-man surface. And then a lot of times we'll put an H back there as kind of um, a wing as well. And so if you decide to go unbalanced, you can pretty much get to everything. You can pull your kind of backside tight end. We call it the open guard. Um, because he's allowed to go out for a pass, but he's still a guard. Um, you can pull him on power. Um, you can usually get a, a nice double team out of that. Uh, with uh, and and a lot of times, what we what you almost always have to do is whether it's power. Uh, we run GT counter stuff. You almost always have to read it because okay. you just don't have extra players in to protect some of these schemes. And so, like if you're going to run 
power strong to an unbalanced set, like your quarterback has to protect that with his eyes and his feet. So, um, sorry, I think I was getting a little feedback there. That's fine. Um, but you know, that, that's just something I realized pretty quickly is we're not going to be effective if our quarterback isn't protecting our run schemes, um, you know, with the ability to pull the ball out. And so we've done that, you know, straight up, you know, we'll read GT counter if that end chases we're pulling. But one of the things we've done more than anything is done a lot of orbit motion. Um, so it, it gives us okay. concepts. Um, and, and a lot of times what, what the orbit motion or the jet motion will do is hold that defensive end. So you can get into some of your gap schemes. Um, but I would say um, the, the fronts that you normally see, I would say um, you see a lot of three down, you know, with a nose, it, it's, it's kind of like a, almost like a bear with the nose and the, the threes. And then they'll maybe walk somebody down as like a Jack overhang um, in the C gap. Uh, you, you actually see a lot of four man fronts. Um, you see a lot of double A gap four man fronts with defensive ends um, out wide. So it's a little bit of everything. I, I don't think you see a ton of, you know, true like 11 man bear fronts, even if you go double, double tight. Um, maybe if you're in an I formation, they might, they might do some of that. But I think the majority of coaches that I've uh, coached against are either in a three or a four front. We started messing around with the two man front and, and fitting from depth, but every coach kind of has a little bit of a different perspective on that. Uh, but in terms of converting, I'd say unless you're in unbalanced or unless you're double tight, uh, you're really not able to do a whole lot of 11 man schemes. You almost have to treat um, anything read like midline. Um, so mm -hmm. like you're going to, if you're going to only have three down linemen, your quarterback has to know that he's pulling it not to get wide, but to get downhill. So if he's going to okay. read the, the defensive end, who's the technically like a three technique, <laughs> yeah. the tough part is like when triple option teams are running midline, that three technique is coming out of a three point stance. Like he normally doesn't, isn't used to being read. Like that's why got that's that element of surprise for sure. With, a, with eight man, your three technique is usually like, you know, in a two point stance, usually he's got big vision, like he's able to see it. And so midline, I just don't think it really works that well against that look, especially if there's no like tackle covering him up. Um, if he's just playing the outside shoulder of your guard, I think it makes it tough. Um, but I think you can, you can run a lot of, a lot of cool schemes. I think one of the schemes that's maybe been best against us at least is trap stuff. We've seen a lot of trap um, just because of the, the short numbers. Um, I think QB power read stuff has always done pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, speed option really gives people problems. Um, in eight man football just because it gets the ball on the edge so quickly. Um, but again, the tough thing is if you want to get to your schemes, like you, if you really want to get to certain schemes, you are tipping your hand a little bit just because the formation does tell you a lot in eight man football um, just because of the limited numbers. Okay. I, how prevalent is the option? Like just straight up triple option in an eight man. Uh, I'm guessing it would be double option. Well, and it's still triple option. I would say like we play a team that runs the equivalent of split back veer. Um, you don't see anymore. Um, and I'm talking with like six foot splits. <clears throat> oh, I bet that's five. nasty. Oh God. Um, we, we play teams that run kind of wishbony stuff out of I formation. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think a ton of people, I don't think people do a ton of, um, a ton of triple option, at least in North Carolina, because you can't cut. Um, okay. I think you can cut in the box, but you can't cut on the edge. Um, so it makes it a little tougher. Um, I, I say you see more spread stuff and more pro stuff, um, at least where I'm at. I would imagine, you know, you get out in Oklahoma and some of these other places. Yeah. I'm sure you see some of that stuff. Um, the reality is though, um, you know, one of the, one of the things that, has given us the most trouble was, was some wing T stuff, but it's wing T stuff without a running back. So you get the two wings and they basically, you know, the coach out there at Rocky Mountain Academy has it set up where the, the running backs will shuffle toward the quarterback out of a wing look and wow. they'll become the running back. But it's not like, it's hard to describe because it's not flex bone where it's like balanced up. It's, 
it's a lot of it, it's it's kind of wing tea. I don't know. It's it's hard to like even put these in. I don't have categories that I can give you because I'm comparing it to eleven man football stuff. But it's it's all kinds of crazy stuff. I'm just glad I don't have to see it. <laughs> All right, good stuff. Here we go. Uh, Coach Smith wants you to come to Mexico City for some clinics. Hey, yeah. I, I played down in Mexico in 2016. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. there you go. Love, love Mexico. There's some really good football happening down in Mexico, believe it or not. I, I get a lot of Mexican coaches that reach out and like, hey, yeah. it's growing. Oh, it's unbelievable. And the, there's some really good players, um, really physical players. Um, and the coaching, I've been really impressed. The, I'm not that, that it's not growing elsewhere, but the two places that I've like had a lot of conversations with people, mm -hmm. Mexico and then Japan. I mean, phenomenal. Yeah. Coaching. Yeah. And Japan. Yeah. Um, so it's, I love seeing the game grow because, you know, I know on the home front it's, you know, I'm at a school where we have to really sell it, you know, to get kids to come out and play. We're at a small school. And so um, to see it grow worldwide, I'm like, you know, there's, there's still hope for sure. Yes, sir. I think, yeah, I hopefully. think some things we need to do to, to make the game safer and more appealing in the I city. The XFL kickoff. I love that thing. I love it. I love it. I love it, man. I saw it happening live. It was crazy when I, I went down to Houston and I uh, saw the Roughnecks practice. And one of the practices were it was an inner squad scrim or a, a scrimmage with the uh, LA Wildcats. And no one, they were, that was the first time they actually tried the kickoff. They had the refs there and everything. No one knew what the heck was going on. Like at all, they they would they trot it and they'd kick it and everyone just kind of paused and then they picked it up and there was a flag and then the refs would go off to the side and take like ten minutes like hey what 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 should we call what's happening and stuff like that totally it was but we everybody that was on the sideline was like this is the craziest thing and wow. it it I like it because then you have all that space you can just pooch it to and the rule is three seconds and then it's a live ball yeah I'm like you could get creative totally with that and i playing the game man and coaching it i hate the kickoff and kickoff return yeah i hate it i just think it's stupid it's a huge it's a huge injury risk in eight man football in particular you would be you probably wouldn't be surprised but the amount of kickoff returns for touchdowns are unfathomable in eight man <laughs> you can't cover the field i mean it's and then if you put your if you put your best kids out there on kickoff they're running they're playing offense defense and running down 40 yards <clears> for a kick and usually kickoffs last like 12 seconds because kids just run around back there oh, God. and it's oh. just, and we've had so many injuries on kickoff. And so I finally got to the point where I was like, these games are so ridiculously high scoring. Um, I just want to make sure that they don't return a kickoff or a touchdown ever on us. And so we started onside kicking every time. Thank you. That's what and, I say. And we, we got pretty good at onside kicks. So we were cut. We, we averaged like one a game where we'd, we'd recover it, which is awesome. You steal possession, but the biggest thing for me, like, I was like, I don't even care about the football here. I mean, obviously I do, but like, I'm like one, my players aren't getting hurt. And two, my players aren't getting tired on this rep. Um, yeah. Because it's, it's just, it's one of those things for high schools in particular where I'm, this is a part of the game that I think we need to think more critically about because the biggest injuries I've seen in high school football have been kickoff, kickoff return reps. The biggest. Injury. Yeah. It's it, Head injury, to me, it's also injury. stupid because most coaches put their defensive kids on the kickoff team. Right. So you're having them run, like you said, 40 yards down the field, sprinting because coaches are screaming, you can't right. jog on this. Yeah. Then they have to turn around and play play defense. Yeah, exactly. I don't I don't understand it. And I, I would always be like, why don't we just onside kick it? They get – most of the time they return it to the 40, 45 anyways. Yeah. Why don't we just go ahead? Because not only that, you in where I'm from, we have unreliable kickers. Oh, completely. Yeah. So you know, you go, okay, we're gonna pooch it to the right, and somehow he shanks it to the left, and everyone's running to the right, and the guy's running. It's like, no, just hit it on the. Okay, I'm getting on a rant here. Well, but in eight man football, you know, one of the things you're dealing with is, like I said, one person misses a tackle, it's a touchdown. And so for me, as a as an offensive coach, it's great because we can bust some big plays. And I just told my defensive coordinator, I was like, here's the deal, man. Like, you're always going to have bad field position. But I just want you to, to really focus in on doing the best we can in the yardage we have. Because the reality is giving them more field in eight man particularly doesn't necessarily decrease the, the likelihood of them scoring. 
Not necessarily. So the big thing for us was eliminating big plays um, because big plays in eight man, you know, a 20 yard gain in 11 man football is always a touchdown in eight man football, like every time. And so, you know, eliminating those big plays was the biggest thing, but I was like, I'm not worried about points. I'm not worried about any of that stuff. I'm worried about us winning the football game. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. just I have the defense go in with the expectation. Like we're always going to have our backs against the wall. We're never going to have good field position, but the offense is going with that, that, you know, we're, we go for it on fourth down a lot. Like we, I've really tried to limit the amount of special teams that we're doing because nice. it takes a ton of time to practice it. Yeah. And especially with high school kids, like they're, you're talking, you, you nailed, nailed it with the reliability of kickers, the reliability of snappers. Um, you know, even if you have everybody else on the unit working in unison, you know, you have, you usually have a lot of problems at, at that position, unless you have a kid that's specifically trained as a long snapper. And it changes the game when now instead of, cause that the rules say you got four downs to get 10 yards, but for some reason we're like, no, it's three. And then you have to punt. So why don't you use all four to yeah. get the 10? Yeah. And if you go back and actually look at your data for the most part, teams actually average over four yards. Right. So I don't know, four times four, that's 16. I mean, so in 2018, I believe I was looking at this the other day, only four teams in all of FBS averaged less than four yards per carry on offense. I don't, I don't know. I love going for it. Like, I think Kevin <laughs> Kelly hit it on the head, you he know, did. just keep going. And the amount of stress that you put on the defense by them knowing your and your kids not even looking to the sideline like come on coach like they just know we're going for it and yeah. and that was I was like to get me to punt I, and I told our kids at the beginning of the year I'm like to get me to punt is going to take an act of congress so like <laughs> just expect like we're going for it unless yeah. unless it's just such a bad situation but still I love it I love it all right um couple more questions that I want to get into your social media because I, I freaking love it. You're the first one. Like I have the bell on Twitter that I get your alerts <laughs> and same thing with Instagram. That's awesome. Um, we have coach Robinson. He coached in six man for three years, created the air six, uh, loves what you're doing. Um, coach Dan, can you bully the O with zone blitzes if you're faster up front? Yeah. Um, Man, I, I would love to say, yes, I think, I think one of the things you run into, at least in eight man, is that things have, things have got to get home because those zones are just massive. Um, so, you know, for me, you know, I played, obviously, played in college. I love the fire zone stuff. I love the three over three, the two over four stuff. Like, I, I loved all that stuff um, because I had, you know, I knew the ball had to come out. The problem is in eight man football, like if you're, if you bring five, that means you have three players left to cover the entire field. So <laughs> it's like that Madden engage eight, yeah, yeah, bring exactly. everybody, but three. Yeah. And, and you see a lot of teams bring four and that, like, that's a pretty consistent theme. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, but then what you'll see is they'll play a lot of man behind that. I think to play zone behind it, the tough part is the rules, because if you get, if you're playing, you know, a three man zone, you just have to accept the fact that if you're, if you're going to play a three man zone, you're either leaving one whole hash of the field wide open, or you're leaving like whole, you're leaving whole segments of the field wide open and you just can't have it both ways. Um, and so I think zone blitzing can get a little dangerous. I think one of the things that we try and do more than anything is, by if we bring five, we're hoping to keep five in uh, okay. or keep four in at least. Um, so if that running back wants to get out, you know, we might peel with it or something like that. But okay, I'm not saying you can't. I know this past year I got really excited about us playing like some some cover three and some some quarter stuff because I wanted to adapt it and it worked out really poorly for us. And a lot of that was my fault as a coach of um it, it's just tough because we play in the summer, we play seven on seven, just like everybody else. And we go play big schools and we, we compete. The problem is like my, my players understand all of those coverage concepts in 11 man, like an 11 man setting and like a seven on seven setting. And when I was trying to adapt it 
I just didn't do a good job. So I'm sure there's an eight man football coach out there that has found a really good zone scheme, especially with blitzing and really good rules for the players. I haven't figured that out yet. And that's something that's kind of in my off season um, to do list right now. But uh, okay. I would, I would love to say you can, I haven't figured out how to do it. I think the biggest thing um, with, with zone blitzing is you just have to accept the fact that you're going to leave large chunks of the field uncovered. And if you're okay with that and you can really dictate where that ball's going, I say you can definitely do it. Okay. Good answer. I like that. Coach Ryan, how much four wide would you run? We are twins with single opposite majority. Uh, man. So we do some empty stuff. Um, but for me, the empty stuff, we, we do a lot of motion. So like, if I'm an empty more, more often than not, I'm going to do a jet motion, an orbit motion, some sort of motion to, to change the strength of the defense or um, to give some sort of play action opportunity off okay. of that or, or relief, um, you know, uh, check down type option. Um, but we have, I, I think realistically in eight man um, going four wide is, tough unless you have four legitimate threats to catch the football um because i think the coaches that that i compete against at least do a really good job of um of matching up um and really you know they do a lot of cone coverage or or doubling your best receiver um and so unless you have guys that can really win one-on-ones that you can can get get in advantageous situations i don't think four wide is is the most effective for eight man. I like seeing it if I'm on defense, to be honest, because I know that there's certain players we don't have to worry about as much. Um, but one of the things that we do, if we do go empty, which we do from time to time, is we have a motion we call slide motion. So essentially the, the running back or our, our kind of like, he, he's still our running back, we split him out and then we'll bring him in motion and he'll be running full speed like it's jet motion. And then when he hits like, the distance of like between the tackle and the quarterback, he'll flip his hips to get parallel to the line of scrimmage. And so by the time the snap hits the quarterback's hands, he's in phase for all of our run game stuff. Oh, wow. So I love it. Um, I know Chip Kelly did something similar when he was at Oregon. It was like kind of wishbony stuff out of shotgun that he did, but he Mm -hmm. would do, um, he would do that. We call it slide motion. I have no idea what he called it, but um, flipping the hips and being able to get downhill in the run game out of empty. Cause I think for the longest time we would do a lot of jet stuff and with the edge being so short and teams triggering on, on our jet motion, we just got busted up in the backfield a lot. And so we, we just knew we needed to get something because we, we tried a little bit harder this past year to keep our running back out of the run game as best we could. Cause he was very valuable. Um, and he's, he's going to be going and playing college ball next year. Um, but he, um, we wanted to keep him out of the run game a little bit more. So that slide motion allowed us to get downhill and get to all of our run concepts without, um, w- in, and still be an empty and still do some things, some things out of that. So, okay. I think I remember what you're talking about that slide mode with the, yep. uh, with that. Yep. And they'd bring him from, mo- yeah, that uh-huh. was nasty. I, I, I miss that old, the old Oregon. I'd sometimes watch him on youtube when i'm Do it all the time <laughs> yeah okay it was, that's why. yeah it was that's that's a spirit animal for me right there <laughs> all right coach uh brian wants to know i'm just summarizing here do you see a lot of air raid offenses in eight man or is it more run oriented uh i would say um it's more run oriented Okay. We put in some some air raid concepts that I liked a lot this past year. The problem is you're you're just missing some options. So like if if you want to run mesh, you're not going to be able to have that like outside choice route really, yeah. um, or you're not going to be able to protect, or you know you're just you're sacrificing certain things. Um, so mesh mesh wasn't great for us because it took a little bit too long to develop, um, unfortunately. Uh, but some of the Y cross stuff was great. I mean, oh, Y cross was awesome for us. Um, you know, I, I think, I think you, you see a little bit of, of air raid stuff. I think the, the difficulty is because you see more man and less zone, um, 
you're seeing a little bit more like max protection stuff and trying to win one-on-ones just because okay. you're, you're going to get, uh, you're going to get more man coverage in eight man. Um, so I think with, I think, you know, some of the, the secret sauce with, with the air raid is the ability to um, flex with man or zone. And really like those, those concepts, you either sit it down versus zone or, or keep, keep it going versus man and, and climb or something like that. But it's, there's not as much reading of the defense in eight man. Um, you know, pretty quickly what you're going to get. Um, okay. And so I don't think, I don't think you have like quite the the same side adjustments. We do some side adjustment stuff on like our longer play action stuff, like our boot stuff or half boot stuff. But um, the majority of the time it's, it's us trying to create one-on-ones. Okay. Now I want to segue into your social media and coaches. Yeah. If you haven't seen his social media, I'm going to, copy and paste it into the chat uh how are you so good at creating film and breaking it down i'm just going to point blank like it is unbelievable uh man i mean if you go back far enough i was pretty bad at it um i think i was just just consistent and kept doing it um i had i got some really good advice when i started coaching um i had somebody advise me and i just continue to pass this advice down to every every person i meet um someone advised me to start with the position I knew least about and mm-hmm. learn as much as I could. And that I would develop an understanding of everything else that was going on if I really focused in. So I was a quarterback in high school, defensive back in college, felt pretty good about pass game stuff. Um, and so I just decided I was going to do a deep dive on offensive line run game. Um, Cause I, I knew nothing. I knew absolutely yeah. nothing. Philosophically, I knew nothing technique wise. I knew I barely even could tell you, um, the difference between a zone and a gap scheme. Like I was just like, they're running. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I, I mean, I really was pretty ignorant on it. And, um, and I knew that that was going to be an important component to the game. So I think I started off really, really studying that. And it was cool because as I was studying and as I was putting things out, um, I decided that, you know, when I started coaching, I was like, I'm going to post one thing a day and put it out there in the, in the wide world of Twitter and, and see what coaches say. And I got a lot of feedback and a lot of like, you're an idiot, you know, nothing, you don't know what you're talking about. And I just was like, well, I, I don't, so I'm not going to get offended. I'm not going to like stop yeah. posting. I'm like, that actually helps me. Like, Oh, this isn't power. Like okay, I didn't actually know. Um, and so I, I got a lot of feedback and, and you kind of, you realize like who's giving you like feedback to help you and who's like trolling you pretty quickly. Yeah just kind of let those things roll off my back and one that um i always tell like young coaches when they ask me and i'm i am a young coach but what i tell them a lot is like i just think the best thing you can do is make your mistakes out loud um and not be shy about them and just say what you think and then allow people to correct you that's why i like i hate this idea of like i've heard so many coaches say like as a graduate assistant, like in college, you know, your job is to sit in the back of the room, shut up and like, don't say anything and learn. And I'm like, the only way I learned is through saying what I thought something was and then somebody correcting me and like having a back and forth um, and then researching it once I realized I didn't know what it was. Um, and so I hate this idea that like, you can only speak from the right to speak. And so one of the things I encourage my coaches to do is like, just like give, give me an idea like give me give, what do you think like what would be a good idea and we just we try to have kind of an idea meritocracy like the best idea always wins like yeah. no matter where it comes from and so for me like the whole reason i i've studied so much and looked into everything from air raid to triple option to wing t to wishbone like i i've tried to study everything because i want the best idea like whatever that best idea is i want it and so i've just like been searching for stuff and I've had some unbelievably generous coaches that have sat down with me and talked things through, have sent me a DM, have responded, have sent me film, like just guys are awesome. Like coaches are awesome. And, you know, of course you always have, you know, those guys that, that aren't so awesome um, and don't want to give you any, don't give you the time of day and think they think that they've perfected it. But I would say the majority of guys that I've run into have been super generous and, Um, really well-meaning and wanting to share information in the game and and so I think like 
you know, over the, over the past few years of like trying to do one thing a day and learn one thing a day, it was instead of trying to say, I want to be an offensive guru. I just said, I want to learn one thing a day. And that has kind of like grown into something where I feel like I have some ideas for myself now. Um, it grew from like maybe two and a half years of just feeding off of other people's ideas to like saying, you know, maybe I have, maybe I have some ideas of my own that, that might work. Um, so, you know, I don't know if I'm, if I'm necessarily that good at, good at it or anything, but I think I've just tried. You are, to- stop being, start, <laughs> stop being humble. But I've, I've tried to learn from, from different people and tried to pick up on um, not so much what they're doing, but how they're doing it. Um, and uh, the, the reasoning behind it, I think that's what fascinates me more than anything. Is like, do you pad? Do you pad games? I don't. Um, okay. I look for rhythm. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think everybody's different. Like, there's, there's, I think that there are math and science coaches and there are English and history coaches. Um, I'm an English Explain. coach. I'm an English. Explain coach. that analogy. Okay. So you have the kind of more analytical, like they want, they they have the the menu for play calling, like they, they have everything mapped out to the second. Like I would say like the way that I experience the game is through like rhythm poetry. Like I, I, I want to see it up here instead of just like get caught up in the particular plays and what beats this coverage. And so like one of the things that I, that one of the reasons I love the air raid is because it's a philosophy. It's not just plays. Um, like, everybody can run the plays, but like to have the air raid philosophy. So a little bit of backstory on me, I played defense, but the offensive coordinator at Davidson when I was there was Matt Mum. So coach mummy, I got to see the air raid philosophy play out over two years uh-huh. um, when I was at Davidson and I just ate it up. I loved it. And the coach at Davidson now is actually a triple option guy. So I've gotten to see like these different philosophies and I'm like, man, they're so similar in so many ways but I just, I like to see how things like fit together as a whole, you know, and that, and so for me, even as a play caller, like I describe myself as more of like a rhythm play caller. Like I want to, mm-hmm. I want to get a feel for the game. Like I don't necessarily have my 20 openers that I'm like, I'm going to hit at least 18 of these. Like you have some coaches that are like that, like we're all yeah. preparation kind of happens. With and, and, and I, I've learned the value of preparation. I mean, invaluable obviously but for me i also am trying to get in a rhythm during the course of the game to say like we're putting deposits in the bank over here like maybe this wide zone thing isn't working right now but it's making that defensive line run and so when we come with a a counter gap scheme later like you know that's gonna that's gonna the fact that we ran this early is gonna benefit us later um and so you know thinking of not just setting up a particular play but on the on the grand the the big scale of football like what are what are we doing philosophically what what direction are we headed in um and so i don't know if that made a ton of sense but i i just think that there are some there are some coaches that want to have every answer for everything i want to be able to clear my mind of a lot of things and really be clear on like what what story am i telling in this game like offensively like i know that sounds kind of weird and 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 i don't know if that makes sense to a lot of coaches like (laughs) we are telling a story each game like we are with our with our players with the ways that we're calling plays with the how we're distributing the ball to different players like we are telling a story and and sometimes we're riding a hot hand and sometimes we're riding the call that seems to be working like i i i'm a firm believer you should fear the guy with the the small small call sheet (laughs) yes and to me it's like a, a a really an expert jazz musician who can riff 100%. 100%. No, like he know he knows his his offense like the back of his hand what yeah. he can and can't do, Absolutely. but then he just gets in the flow. Yeah, he can call and he doesn't even have to look. So I I totally understand what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, and and ultimately, if you, I think you are empowering your players when you are headed a little bit more in that direction, like I try to give my quarterbacks a lot of leeway um, to either tell me what they want or to call mm-hmm. themselves. Like we have a whole yeah. series. Um, we, we have different levels of tempo and our fastest tempo is our green tempo. And the quarterback is calling that whole series. Oh, wow. like, I don't do anything. I just sit there That's and nice. if it goes really well. He might get another series. <laughs> if it goes really bad, <laughs> I might hey, take give, me, give me the control. Yeah. Give, and, give and it back there, to me. There are times where he's, he will 
he's like, I don't know. I, I don't like this book. Help me out. And I, and I jump in obviously, but, but I like giving them the the confidence that like, they know, the game plan. they know the offense, like not me, but when you give them responsibility, what I've found is like, when, when I give my quarterbacks responsibility, guess who's in my office every single day, asking questions, running things by me, the quarterback, because he knows one series per game, he's going to get to, he's going to get That's awesome. the reins. And, and then what you have is all his friends, all his buddies, they want the ball. So they're like, Hey, we should run this play in your green series. Like, make sure you call this. And all of a sudden you have like this team, like this game plan within the game plan where these guys are getting together and really understanding what we do offensively and how it all fits together instead of me just relaying a call into them. So I, I want my players to understand conceptually and be able to, to put that into practice. Okay. Well, coach, I, I appreciate you coming on, man. Oh, for sure, man. It was awesome. It was awesome. Uh, also coaches, I don't know. I forgot to say this. Uh, coach here is 35. What is it? 35 for 35 or 35 under 35? 35. Yeah. Toot your own horn, man. Tell us what, what is that? Man, it was awesome. The AFCA gave me a chance to, to come on out to Nashville this, this past convention and, and go to a leadership Institute essentially, which we just got to, I got to sit in there with a bunch of other uh, coaches, majority of them in, in college who just got to learn a, a whole bunch from those guys. And they brought in a, a bunch of speakers to kind of really <clears throat> give us basically like, man, it was felt like drinking out of a fire hose for 10 hours. But, um, it, was, <laughs> it was awesome stuff. And um, again, just another, another um, opportunity, I think, um, to learn, but also just to experience the generosity of some of those, those college coaches that were willing to share stuff with me and kind of their process and how they do things. And, you know, I appreciate the AFC. I know that um, in the past that everybody's kind of thought, oh, it's just for college coaches, but I think they're really trying to invest in, in high school coaches too and give them, give them more resources. And that's, that's part of the thing for me too. Like, I just, I know how difficult it can be because I'm, I'm one myself to, to be a high school coach and with limited resources and you don't, you can't get the, the information you want all the time, but the more we can share with each other, the more resources we give each other, the, I think the better we are as a, as a whole for sure. Heck yeah, man. Well said. Well, coach, I appreciate you coming on. Absolutely. I, I would love to get you back on Let's later on if, okay. Absolutely. All right. Uh, if you would just stay on after this is over with so we can talk. For sure. Uh, coaches, thank you all for joining us again. If you like it, if you want to see some great cut ups with some killer emojis, your emoji <laughs> game is on point too, man. That's I mean, it is freaking yeah. amazing. Do you do all of that on your phone? yeah i do i do that is insane so you need to check it out um twitter and instagram which which platform do you prefer i, I do most of it on twitter i kind of okay. throw stuff up on instagram because most of my international friends are, are on instagram so I, I okay well follow him on both it is unbelievable and until next time coaches let's continue to master the spread score points and have fun y'all have a good night